We're going to be in, you may be seated. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. So if you have your Bible or your phone, you can go ahead and go there. They'll be on the screen in a moment. But since we're celebrating our graduates today, I wanted to spend some time talking about something that will help them fulfill all that the Lord has for them in life. I remember graduating high school. It was back in uh, 1995, uh, and it was me and about 11 or 12 other uh, seniors. It was a very small private school that used to be down on Roswell Road just south of, of Abernathy. And, and so we had our graduation at a, at a restaurant at 103 West. I don't know if that's still there or not, but we had our graduation at 103 West. We had to pay for our own meals, and I had to wear a tuxedo. All right, so that was my graduation. That's probably a little different than what y'all are going to experience on, on Tuesday. But that's what I got to experience. Now, I got the typical graduation when I graduated from Reinhardt University and Asbury University. Uh, I got the typical graduation there. And even though I never really cared about attending my graduation ceremonies, uh, I only did it because my, my mama made me, uh, I still felt this sense of excitement mixed with fear and dread as I realized that I could do anything I wanted to after graduation. Now the fear came in because I realized I could do anything I wanted to after graduation, but I had no idea what I wanted to do after graduation. I was not really listening to God that much in my life at that time. And so I was completely lost. I had no idea what I was gonna do with my life. And so if, if you know today exactly what you're gonna do after you graduate, I want to say congratulations to you, all right, because you're ahead of the curve. Because a lot of people uh, don't know what they're going to do when they go to college, right? But you may know you want to be a doctor like your mom, all right? You may know you want to be a teacher. You may know you want to be a lawyer. Oh, I hope not. You, you may want to be a programmer. But whatever it is, you know that you're work, what you're working towards, right? And you can't wait to begin it. Maybe if you're a, 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 like a lot of young people, you think, all right, I'm going to go to college, I'm going to make good grades, and then I'll graduate, and then I'll begin my career. It'll be that simple, right? Well, I don't want to burst your bubble, but it doesn't really happen like that for most people, right? The reality is, if your desire is to do what God created you to do, then the enemy is going to do everything he can to throw you off course. And guess what? God is going to allow him to do it at times. To try to throw you off course. See, the truth is, you are going to be tested. And I don't mean in biology or history. Your faith is going to be tested. I want to say that again. Are you listening? Everybody tune in. Your faith, if you're chasing after what God has for you, your faith will be tested. His plans will be tested. And the reality is, if you're living away from home, no one has to know how you respond to those tests. Right? When we leave home, we are free to do whatever we want to do. And for some parents, that's a terrifying thought. But it's the truth, right? And it's easy, guys, to think that what happens in college stays in college. Right? Your parents aren't there to stop you or catch you, right? And all the parents are saying, will you please stop talking about that? <laughs> I get it. Because they want you to believe, kids. They want you to believe that your dorm room is bugged and they have cameras everywhere. And they may. I'm not going to say they, they don't, all right? I don't get in trouble. But the truth is, once you leave home, it's going to be up to you and you alone to make good, God-honoring decisions. You're going to be tested. Your faith will be tested. You will be tested. Tempted. It doesn't matter what college you're going to, you're going to be tempted. I went to two Christian uh, colleges, but that did not stop me from being tested, nor did it stop me from making a lot of dumb decisions. <laughs> Thanks, Padre. And some of those decisions continue to affect my life to this day. And that is something that I did not understand back then. I remember talking to someone about this very topic not too long ago, and, and the person commented that they thought it was important and good for young people to get into some of those temptations because it teaches them a lesson. 
you laugh, but that is a common belief within the church. And it amazes me how many people buy into that craziness. But I think I understand why, right? They look at their life today, and because they aren't broke, homeless, or dead, then the choices they made in college didn't really affect their life. But church, here's the truth. If all you know is dirty water, slightly cleaner water seems great. But the truth is, every decision we make shapes who we are and the types of relationships that we're going to have. How we respond to the test in life will shape who we are. How we respond to the test in life will shape our relationships. How we respond to the test in life will either get us closer to Jesus farther away from Jesus. And this is when a lot of people will say, well, yeah, but I can always come back to Jesus later and everything will be okay. Do you know why I share so much of my story in my sermons? There's a lot of preachers who, who think I shouldn't share as much as I do, but I share a lot about my story. You know why? It's because I want to utterly destroy that line of thinking. That says, well, I can misbehave in my younger years and just come back to Jesus later and everything's going to be okay. I want you to hear me. Uh, reconciliation and forgiveness is always possible for every one of us. However, forgiveness does not always erase consequences. Because of my past actions, I will never be exactly who I was created to be. While my God can redeem and use all things, it doesn't diminish the fact that the choices I have made in my life have had a devastating impact on my life and the life of those around me. Therefore, my goal today is to not only show you four examples of tests that you might face, but I also want to tell you how you can pass those tests. Now, I won't be able to help you pass your math test, so don't ask. But I can help you pass in spiritual tests. Because before most blessings in life are tests. And if we do not respond correctly to the test in life, we will miss out on the blessings in life. See, I want for you everything Jesus has for you. I want you all to live the life that you were created to live. However, that cannot fully happen. When we choose the wrong answers on the test. That's why I barely passed every math class, math class I was in. And when I was a student, that's all I cared about, right? As long as I passed, that's all that mattered. Right? As long as I just got a, a C or a D, I was happy. However, because that was my attitude in all of my classes... I barely graduated. That little college, that little school I went to down on Olive Road, I only went there because I wasn't going to graduate on time. So I barely graduated. And I missed out on so many opportunities. When I was in high school, the uh, choral director at Georgia State University, Brent, uh, saw me sing on a, on a, uh, saw, saw me sing a solo uh, in, in church and asked me to attend Georgia State University so that he could work with me. He wanted me to be in the choir. Now, as soon as he asked me to do it, my head just grew like three sizes, right? Because I had been personally asked to attend Georgia State University. So here we go, right? This was the beginning of my future. I was about to become a world-class singer. I probably tour the world. I was going to be rich and famous. So you can imagine my surprise when I applied to Georgia State and they very politely said, no, thank you. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I mean, didn't they know, know who I was? I was special. I was important. How could they say no to me? Turns out all, all that not caring about my grades didn't turn out too great for me. Imagine that. I want that for you guys. Whether you're headed for college or retirement. I don't want you to miss out on the life you were created to live. Whether you're still in school or in your 40s, 50s, or 60s, I don't want you to miss out on the blessings the Lord has for you. So today I want to look at four different ways we're testing in life. So it's Genesis chapter 22, beginning in verse 1. It says this, Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to Abraham, 
Here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Let's stop there for a moment. We're going to call this the obedience test. The obedience test. But there are actually two tests in, that, in those two verses. The first is God calling Abraham. Did you know that you don't have to answer God? It's true. No one has to answer God. If you feel God is calling your name, you don't have to answer. Your parents cannot make you answer the Lord. It is your right, students, it's your right, church, to say no to God. So what do you think? When you leave home and you're on your own, do you think he'll answer when he calls you? That's the first test. And then there's the obedience test. The obedience test was what happened after Abraham answered the call. God told Abraham to kill his son Isaac as an offering to God. Now, just because you don't have a kid or, or plan on having a kid anytime soon, hear that, you don't plan on having a kid anytime soon, don't fool yourself into thinking that you're never going to be tested in this way. <laughs> don't get hung up on the fact that God told Abraham to sacrifice his son. The sacrifice wasn't about Isaac. The sacrifice was about Abraham being willing to let go of the most important thing to him, his son. We, we all have a most important thing, don't we? We all have a most important thing. I don't know what that is for you, but, but I want you to think about that something that you could not imagine living without. Abraham and his wife Sarah had to wait until they were in their 80s and 90s before they could have their first child. And now God was calling Abraham to kill him. The Lord came to Abraham and basically said, you know that most important thing in your life? I want you to kill it. If Abraham chose to be faithful, it meant he would have to live the rest of his life without the most important thing in his life. Could you do it? I don't mean your kid, but the most important thing, whatever it is, could you do it? If you've planned to be a teacher your entire life, could you walk away from that if Jesus told you to? If you had worked hard all your life to be able to afford the nice house and all the nice toys, could you give it all away if Jesus told you to? Or maybe you're dating the hottest guy in school. Could you walk away from that relationship if the Lord told you to? God wanted Abraham to be willing to let go of the most important thing in his life. And it was up to Abraham to answer. So look back at the passage in verse 3. It says, Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servant, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said. Where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, 
I will surely bless you and make you make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the, of the cities of their enemies. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Now, there are a couple things I want you to see there. It seems pretty shocking to us that Abraham would say yes to sacrificing, to killing his son. Right? It's impossible for me to imagine making that kind of sacrifice. Even on the days where my kids are driving me crazy, I can't imagine getting to that point of putting them on an altar. So how could Abraham do it? Was Isaac just driving him crazy? Not exactly. In fact, Abraham lets us know exactly why he was willing to say yes. Did you catch it? It's in verse 7 and 8. Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham replied, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. Do you see it? Abraham chose to be faithful because he knew he worshipped a faithful God. You see, we get ourselves into trouble when we think we know exactly what God is up to. It would be easy for Abraham to think that if he did what the Lord was asking, that he would be left without a son and be miserable for the rest of his life. But that's not what happened. Why? Because Abraham knew. Don't miss that word. Abraham knew that he worshipped a faithful God. That is why he was able to say God himself will provide the lamb for the offering. In fact, before they left to climb the mountain, Abraham was telling people that the Lord was going to show up. Right? He told his servants, stay here with the donkeys while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. See, he knew before he left that Isaac was coming home with him. See, when we know we worship a faithful God, we don't fear being obedient. We know that whatever we do for the Lord is never wasted. The Lord blesses our obedience. Because of Abraham's obedience, the Lord told him, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of, of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. You see, church, the test came before the blessing. Abraham would have missed out on the blessing if he had failed the test. The same is true for us. We will miss the blessing. If we fail the test. I remember, this is not my sermon, but uh, I was talking uh, about it this morning, that um, a couple years ago, God told me to go down to the Marietta Square and preach. And I went, huh? He said, I want you to go down to Marietta Square, I just want you to stand there and preach. And I said, I don't want to do that at all. That sounds like a bad plan. I don't like that plan. Um, and so I kept praying about it. He just would not let it go. And so I gathered up some friends of mine who played music. And we went down to the Marietta Square. They sang some worship songs. And then I got up without a microphone and just started preaching. And the, and the square was full of people. And I think one person stopped for like five minutes to listen. And I got done preaching. And I just went, well, that was a complete waste of time. And that's when later my family said, uh, you're an idiot. It's not a waste of time because you were faithful. You have no idea what God did in that square that day, but you were faithful. See, sometimes church being faithful, passing that obedience test, doesn't always lead to us seeing the outcome. The important part is being obedient. The second test we will call the patience test. Now, full disclosure. I struggle with this test all the time, all right? Now, I know patience is a fruit of the Spirit, but um, for me, patience might, be, might, might as well be that fruit, durian. Do y'all know durian? Anyone know durian, the fruit? Nobody? Okay. All right, one, all right. Durian is this fruit that when you cut it open, it smells like death. 
and dirty socks mixed together. Like it is, I've never smelled it, but I've watched enough, enough cooking shows to know this thing has to be like the worst smelling thing in the world, right? It is so bad that it's banned from public spaces in Singapore and Malaysia. It smells so bad. So patience might as well be durian for me. I don't want anything to do with it. It ain't in my house. I don't like it. It's the fruit of the spirit that I most often leave behind. That does not stop the Lord from, from testing my patience. Now, a perfect example of this test of the Bible would be the story of Moses. Right? No sooner does Moses rescue and deliver the Israelites from the Egyptians that they are brought before the Red Sea with nowhere else for them to go. God has called Moses to lead the Israelites to, their, to the promised land, but then they're stopped in their tracks by the Red Sea. And that's a pretty big obstacle. That's a pretty big obstacle. And Moses doesn't have a boat, especially for the million or so Israelites that are following him. So after four, over 400 years in captivity, they were finally headed to freedom to only be stopped by the Red Sea. I have no problem admitting this in church that I probably would have screamed, you have got to be kidding me, right? God finally frees us to only have us recaptured because of a dead end. They're stopped. Now, we don't know how long they stood on the shore before God parted the sea, but it was long enough for them to, to, to really struggle with patience. In fact, some began to complain to Moses. Some were even willing to go back to Egypt because at least there they had food. Right? Today we live in a microwave world. We don't have to wait long uh, for much anymore. Amazon can get orders to our house even before we order them, right? It seems that way. We don't expect to have to wait for much in our life. I know when I was in college, I was convinced that whatever job I ended up doing, I would move up pretty quickly. I was convinced that I would be making $150,000 a year in no time. I'm still waiting uh, to make that. That's why we're going to pass the offering basket one more time today. <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> Kidding. Uh, but you're welcome to put more in. Uh, but that didn't happen to me, right? We convince ourselves that if God wants us to have something, he, he's not going to make us wait for it. I'm not sure why we think that, but we do. I mean, he may have made, he may have made Moses wait, not us. Guess what? Patience is a fruit of the Spirit because God knows us and knows that we all really stink at being patient. What the Israelites did not understand at the time was that the dead end was just delayed deliverance. That's all. The dead end was just delayed deliverance. And sometimes, church, that delay is by design. God will hold back a breakthrough. God will hold back an answer to prayer, a deliverance, in order to test us. Are we faithful? Are we patient? See, God knows we're impatient people. That impatient, uh, impatience, impatient nature of ours gets us into trouble time and time again. We may believe God has a spouse for us, but we get tired of waiting, and so we sleep with our boyfriend or girlfriend. We may believe God has a great job for us, but we get tired of waiting, and so we take the first job that's offered to us. Impatience has not only gotten me into much trouble in my life, but it's also caused me to miss out on so much in my life. My impatience led me to missing out so much in my relationship with my wife. Of course, I didn't know that at the time, right? I figured my impatience at the age of 18 would never have a negative effect on me when I was 35. Church, I was very, very wrong. If God tells you he's going to open a door for you, your job is to sit in front of that door and praise him. You rejoice over the future opening of the door. Amen. No matter how long it takes him to open that door. Some of you are old enough, Mike, to remember waiting outside a Turtles record store to buy uh, concert tickets. 
See, back in the day, kids, we actually had to go to the store to buy music. And we would line up for hours before the store would open in order to buy tickets because we didn't want to miss the opportunity. We would sit there for hours knowing there was no guarantee we would get a ticket. Right? We would sit there because we wanted it. We wanted it so badly we were able to we were willing to sit there for hours, and yet we refused to wait for what God has for us, even though we know He will give it to us if we're faithful. If God has led you to a door, He will open it if you remain faithful and wait on Him. And so if you're waiting on Him, then praise Him in the waiting. Don't let your impatience lead you to make decisions that have far-reaching consequences on your life and the life of others. So are you patient? The third test, test is the uh, faith and belief test. The faith and belief test. How many of you have ever begged God to show you the entire road that he's calling you to walk down? Right? He's called you to something. You're like, okay, let me see the entire road. I want to see every pitfall. I want to see every turn. I want to see it all. Right? Nobody likes to be given a piece of Ikea furniture without instructions or even a picture of what the product's going to be. Right? It would drive us crazy. We want to see the picture. We want to see the end product before we continue on. I mean, fine, God, you're calling me to this career. But before I say yes, just how much money are we talking about here? We tend to want to know exactly what we're walking into. And again, we can look at the story of the Israelites. Shortly after delivering the Israelites from the Egyptians, Moses brought them right up to the promised land. Now, instead of sending all of them in immediately, he sends in 12 spies. So they could see what the land had and, and who was in the land, what was, what was going on in the land. Right? It's a good plan. So if that's the land, let's go see what it's going to be, and then y'all come back and report to us what you saw. And so the 12 spies sneak into the promised land, and they return with a report. They come back telling the rest of the people that the people who dwell there are strong, that many of the cities are, are fortified, that it was a land that, that devoured its inhabitants, that all the men they saw were of great stature, and that they were like grasshoppers grasshoppers in the face of these types of, of giants. It's not exactly the report that people wanted to hear. And so not surprisingly, most of the people feared going where God was leading them. However, there was Joshua and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb were two of the 12 spies, and they came back with a very different report. They saw the exact same things the other 10 spies saw. But they had a completely different outlook and a completely di different perspective about all of it. They had just seen God miraculously deliver them from, e from Egypt. So they knew God would have no problems in taking out the giants and the strongholds they saw in the promised land. However, as a result of these other ten spies coming back with this bad report, this kindled the anger of God and caused him to then pronounce a very severe judgment on all of them. He told the ten spies that, that they and all the other men over 20 years of age would not enter the promised land. He said that they would wander in the desert for the next 40 years where they would then all eventually die out there. However, since Joshua and Caleb had a different spirit about them and fully believed that God could take out all of these giants and strongholds, he told them that both of them and all the people under 20 years of age would be the ones who would be allowed to enter the promised land. All because they had enough courage, faith, and belief in the Lord that he could give them the victories once they had crossed over and started to possess parts of the land that he wanted them to have for themselves. That's the faith and belief test. God showed them exactly what was waiting for them on the other side. And the test was, can they believe in God and his supernatural power to defeat the enemies and strongholds they would have to directly face? Or will they want to turn around and go back into the desert, never giving God a chance to show them what he could miraculously do for them? 
See, there's a reason God rarely shows us too much of the road ahead of us. But when it, but when he, when he does, what happens if we don't like what we see? Will we be faithful and believe that if God has called us to walk this road, He will provide the means? God wants to see how we will respond when the road ahead is not exactly what we thought it should be. See, it's pretty common to head into college thinking everything is going to be great. And I hope it is for you. I hope when you go to college all four or five years or six years for me, uh, all those years are great years for you. However, I have lived long enough to know if people are involved in something, that something can go sideways really quickly. So what happens when the road you thought would be smooth becomes rocky and rough? Will you bail? Will you bail? Or will you trust? And finally, the fourth test is the sin test. After Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness for a time of, of, of prayer and fasting. And so after 40 days of fasting, Jesus was, was weak and tired and hungry. And that's when the enemy attacked. Hear that. The enemy attacked when he was weak and hungry. When you're at your weakest is when the enemy attacks the most. But why would God send his son Jesus out into the desert to let the devil tempt him, knowing full well that he was going to pass the test anyway. And if he wanted to test him, why this kind of test? See, Jesus had to face temptation so that he could understand what it's like for each of us. But it's vital for us to understand how Satan tempted Jesus. See, Satan took scripture, young people. He took scripture and he twisted it just a little bit. Just a little bit. It sounded good. But it wasn't fully scripture. Now because Jesus is Jesus, he recognized the deception. But unfortunately, we aren't as quick. I'll give you an example. You head off to college. And you fall in love with the handsomest man in all the world. Right? He's gorgeous. Just dreamy. Right? And he's kind, and he's sweet, and again, he's gorgeous, right? He's everything that uh, Pastor Lean thinks I am, right? <laughs> Thanks, babe, for the encouragement there. All right. <laughs> Hoping for an amen there. Uh, all right. But you're convinced that because he's so gorgeous and dreamy and kind, that he is the one that you're going to marry, right? This guy is your future husband. And he thinks the same thing about you. He thinks you're gorgeous, sweet, and kind. And he thinks this is the girl that I'm going to marry. Now, you grew up in church. And you've heard a thousand sermons and lessons about premarital sex. You've been told a million times that premarital sex is a sin. But what about premarital sex with the person that you're, you are convinced you're going to marry? I mean, you're going to be married one day, probably, so surely it's okay for us to sit together before marriage. I mean, you're not married yet, but one day you will be, so it's probably okay to have sex now, right? Or you know God is calling you into the ministry. And you have every intention of being faithful. But then you, you find out how much you're going to make doing that thing, and that's when the enemy attacks. He says, go after the money. I mean, after all, the more money you have, the more money you can give to the church. I mean, doesn't God want you to tithe? And wouldn't it be nice to be able to make your tithe a lot bigger? So go after the money. That's what the enemy told me. After I graduated college, I didn't know what I was going to do. And, and uh, the, the private school at the church I grew up in, they needed a long-term substitute for 6th and 7th grade Bible. And so they asked me to come in and substitute. And so I did. And at the end of the, the, the quarter, semester, whatever we were on, um, they brought me a contract and said, we'd like to keep you on staff. At the exact same time, I got a job offer at this computer company uh, not too far down the road that paid more money. Guess which one I chose? Guess which job I hated? <laughs> the one I chose. I should have stayed teaching, but I didn't. I chased the money. 
I don't know what it will be for you. But I promise the test is coming. If God allowed Jesus himself to be tempted to sin, don't you think he'll let you? If God allowed Adam and Eve to be tempted to sin, don't you think he'll let you be tempted? Now, Jesus passed the test and began his ministry to save the world. Adam and Eve failed their test, and they lost paradise. See, throughout the Bible, you can find men and women of God being tested. It just comes with the territory, church. Those who follow God will be tested and attacked. Satan will do anything he can to throw us off course, to lead us away from life into death. He is desperate to keep you from the blessings that God has for you. And every time we fail the test, we either lose out on what God has for us or we delay what God has for us. Every call of God will be tested. Look in the Bible and find every person God called. And as soon as they said yes, look for all the tests that they had to go through. Everyone who desires to be faithful to the Lord will be tested. I guarantee you that. I guarantee that. Graduates, I have no idea what tests you'll face in college. You might be tempted to abandon your faith. And don't sit here today and go, that would never happen to me. You might be tempted to give in to your physical desires. You might be tempted to choose a path other than the one Jesus has for you. Again, you're going to be away from mom and dad. No one's going to be there to force you to go to church. No one's going to be there to remind you to read the Bible and to pray every day. It is going to be all up to you. No one forced me to study in school. So I didn't study. I graduated, barely. And to my surprise, no one came calling to offer me a job. No one forced me to go to church when I was in college. So I didn't go to church. I didn't read my Bible. I wouldn't even been able to tell you where my Bible was in my apartment, if it was in my apartment. The only time I prayed was when I knew I was about to fail a test. Now, looking back, I can see how I failed test after test after test the Lord had for me. But then a funny thing happened. The tests stopped. They went away. Now, before you think it was because I came back to Jesus, it wasn't. The test stopped because since I had failed so many, I had moved so far away from Jesus, there was no reason to test me anymore. Eventually, I found myself in the darkest place I could ever imagine, lost, broken, and confused, and so far away from where Jesus wanted me. Don't ever, students, don't ever underestimate the tests. Don't ever think one time won't matter. The next four years of your life are more important than you could ever imagine. I know you want the blessings the Lord has for you, and so you need to be ready for the test. And so I want to give you a cheat sheet today. I know a lot about cheat sheets. I want to give you a cheat sheet today. Read your Bible every day. Read your Bible every day. If for some reason you don't have a Bible, mom and dad, if for some reason you don't have a Bible, you talk to your mom and dad, you talk to your grandparents, you talk to me, we'll get you a Bible. I'll get you 10 Bibles. I don't care. You need a Bible. Read your Bible every day. You need to pray every day. Every day pray. And then go to church. Find a church near the school and go. There's a Wesley Foundation on campus. Go to the Wesley Foundation. You're going to Georgia, aren't you? There's a great Wesley Foundation at the University of Georgia. Get involved. If you don't, it's going to be easier for you to fail every single test. If you will do those three things, you're going to have a greater chance of becoming exactly who God created you to be. Students, it is all up to you now. 
Jesus is ready to go with you, to guide you, to protect you, to help you. The question is, will you take him with you? So right now, I want to ask our graduates and their families to come forward. Graduates, if you'll, you can kneel on the pillows. And mom and dad, grandma and grandpa, uh, y'all come down too. Just stand behind your graduate. And I want each of y'all to lay hands on them. students, families, I ask that you pray your own prayer. Uh, as I pray, you pray out loud if you want to. You pray silently, but pray over these students a prayer of blessing. And then congregation, I want to invite you to pray over these students. And then, and then after I pray, we're going to be able to um, put a blessing on them. So join me in prayer. Christian Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for the awesome opportunity that we have today to not only celebrate these two amazing young women, but also pray over them. To pray for, for them to, to hold on to you as tightly as possible as they go off to college. Lord, you know what's waiting for them. You know the, the trials and the tribulations that they're going to have to face. You know the temptations that, that are going to be uh, coming their way as soon as they step on a campus. Lord, we, we may not know what they are, but you do. And so, Lord, today we pray that they would seek the Holy Spirit to fill them up. They would ask him to fill them up to overflowing so that they could withstand all the temptations of the devil and remain faithful to you. Lord, I pray that each of them would be witnesses of the love of Jesus Christ on campus. That they would, become, they would, come, be, be, they would come to be known as women of faith on campus. That people who are struggling with their faith or struggling with suicidal falls, struggling with depression, struggling in relationships, would come to them and say, I need help. And I'm coming to you because I know you're connected to Jesus. Lord, we pray for protection for them. Lord, you know the feelings that every mom has about sending their child off to college. You know the fear every dad has about sending their uh, daughters off to college. Lord, I pray that you would be with the moms and the dads and the grandmas and grandpas. Give them strength, Lord, to trust in you. But Lord, also remind them every single day to pray for their daughter at college. And maybe, Lord, they set up a routine where every day or every week they gather on FaceTime or on Zoom and spend time praying and reading the Bible together. But, Lord, don't let us neglect these two as they leave us. Let us remember they're still a part of this church. And we're going to continue to pray for them. And we're going to be willing to help them any way we can. So, Lord, bless them. Protect them. Provide for them and let them be a witness to the goodness of our God. I pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Students, if you'll stand back up. Parents, you're welcome to stand with them if you want to, but uh, if y'all can kind of uh, move to the side a little bit so they can see the screen, everyone can see the screen. I invite the congregation to stand.